Egil Saga Skatlakrim Sonar Egil Saga Chapter 64 Egil's life is given to him King Eric sat upright while Egil recited the poem and looked keenly at him and when the song of praise was ended then spoke the king Right well was the poem you recited and now are in beyond I have resolved about the cause between me and Eil, how it shall go. Thou hast pleaded Eil's case with great eagerness, since thou offers to risk a conflict with me. Now shall I for thy sake do what thou hast asked, letting Eil go from my land safe and unhurt. But thou, Eil, so order thy going after, leaving my presence in this hall, you will never come before my eyes, nor my son's eyes, nor be ever in the way of myself or my people. But I give thee now thy head this time for this reason, that thou camest freely into my power. I will do no dastardly deed on you, yet know this for sure, that there is no reconciliation with me or my sons, or any of our kin who wish to wreak their vengeance. Then sang Eil, Loth am I no wise, though in features loathly, helm capped head in pardon from high king to take, who can boast that ever better gift he won him from a lordly sovereign's noble-minded son. Arenbjorn thanked the king with many fair words for the honor and friendship that he had showed him. Then they too, Arenbjorn and Eil, went back to Arenbjorn's house. After that, Arenbjorn bade horses be made ready for his people. He rode away with Eil and a hundred fully armed men with him. Arenbjorn rode with that force till they came to King Athelstan, where they were well received. The king asked Eil to remain with him, and inquired how it had gone between him and King Eric. Whereupon Eil sang, Eil his eyes black-browed, from Eric Raven's friend, welcomed wise help therein, wife's loyal kin lent, my head throne of helmet, and heritage noble, as erst from rough rainstorm to rescue I knew. But at the parting of Arenbjorn and Eil, Eil gave Arenbjorn those two gold rings that King Athelstan had given him, whereof each weighed a mark, and Arenbjorn gave Eil the sword called Dragvandil. This had been given to Arenbjorn by Thor of Skallagrimson, but before that Skallagrim had received it from Thorolf his brother, but to Thorolf the sword was given by Grim Shaggyskin, son of Ketelhang. Ketelhang had owned the sword and used it in his single combat, and no sword was there that was more biting. Eil and Arambjorn parted with much affection. Arambjorn went home to King Eric at York, but Eil's comrades and shipmates had gone peace there and disposed of their cargo under Arambjorn's protection. And as winter wore on, they moved south to England and joined Eil. Chapter 65 Eil goes to Norway There was a baron in Norway called Eric Allwise. He married Thora, daughter of Lord Thorer, sister of Arenbjorn. He owned property eastwards in Vik. He was a wealthy man, much honored, of prophetic foresight. Son of Eric and Thora was Thorstein. He was brought up with Aaron Bjorn and was now fully grown, though quite young. He had gone westwards to England with Aaron Bjorn. But in that same summer, when Eil had come to England, these tidings were heard from Norway that Eric Allwise was dead. The king's stewards had taken his inheritance and claimed it for the king. These tidings, when Aaron Bjorn and Thorstein heard, they resolved that Thorstein should go east and see after the inheritance. So when spring came on and men made ready their ships who went to travel from land to land, 
Then Thorstein went south to London, and there found King Athelstan. He produced tokens and a message from Arnbjorn to the king and also to Eyjol, that he might be his advocate with the king, so that King Athelstan might send a message from himself to King Hakon, his foster son, advising that Thorstein should get his inheritance and possessions in Norway. King Athelstan was easily persuaded to this because Arnbjorn was known to him for good. Then came Eil also to speak with King Athelstan and told him his intention. I wish this summer, said he, to go eastwards to Norway and see after the property of which King Eric and Bergenon robbed me. Atli the Short, Bergenon's brother, is now in possession. I know that if a message of yours be added, I shall get law in this matter. The king said that Eil should rule his own goings, but best methinks were it, he said, for thee to be with me and be made my defender of land and command my army, I will promote you to great honor. Eil answered, This offer I deem most desirable to take. I will say yea to it and not nay. Yet have I first to go to Iceland and see after my wife and the property that I have there. King Athelstan gave then to Eil a good merchant ship and a cargo. There were board for lading wheat and honey, and much money's worth in other wares. And when Eil made ready his ship for sea, then Thorstein Eric's son settled to go with him, he of whom mention was made before, who was afterwards called Thora's son. And when they were ready they sailed. King Athelstan and Eil parting with much friendship. Thorstein landed there. He then preferred his claim to his father's property before the stewards who were settled on his farm. Many lent help to Thorstein in this matter. A meeting was held about it. Thorstein had there many kinsmen of renown. The end was that it was referred to the king's decision. Thorstein, meanwhile, taking to him the safe keeping of his father's possessions. For winter lodging, Eyjol went to Thorstein's with eleven more. Then to Thorstein's house was moved the wheat and honey, a merry time of it they had that winter. Thorstein kept house in great style, for provisions were in plenty. Chapter 66 Eyjol and Thorstein go before the king. King Hakon, Athelstan's foster son, then ruled Norway. The winter, the king held court in the north in Trondheim. But as the winter wore on, Thorstein started on his journey, and Eil with him, and they had about thirty men. When ready, they first went to Upland, thence northwards by the Dover fell to Trondheim, where they came before King Hakon. They declared their errand with the king. Thorstein explained his cause and produced witness that he was rightful owner of all the inheritance which he claimed. The king received this matter well and let Thorstein obtain his possessions, and therewith he was made a baron of the king even as his father had been. Eyjol also went before King Hakon and declared his errand giving therewith King Athelstan's message and tokens. Eil claimed property that had belonged to Bjorn Yeoman, lands and chattels. Half of this property he claimed for himself and Asgurda his wife, and he offered witness and oaths to his cause. He said too that he had set all this before King Eric, adding that he had then not got law owing to King Eric's power and the prompting of Gunhilda. Eir set forth the whole cause which had been tried at the Gula thing. He then begged the king to grant him law in this matter. King Hakon answered, This have I heard that my brother Eric and with him Gunhilda both assert that thou, Eil, hast cast a stone beyond the strength in thy dwellings and thy dealings with them. Now methinks thou, I, and Eric have not the luck to agree, yet thou mightest be well content should I do nothing in this cause. Eil said, 
Thou mayst not, O king, be silent about causes so great, for all men here in the land, native or foreign, must hearken to thy bidding or thy banning. I have heard that thou established here in the land law and right for every one. Now I know that thou wilt let me get these even as other men. Methinks I am of birth and have strength of kinsfolk enough here in the land to win right against that the short. But as for the cause between me and King Eric, there is this to say, that I went before him, and that was so parted that he bade me go in peace whether I would. I will offer thee, my lord, my following and service. I know that there will be here with me men who can in no wise be thought of more martial in appearance than I am. My foreboding is that it will not be long, ere King Eric meet yet you both live, and I shall be surprised if thou come not to me think that Gunhilda has borne too many sons. The king said, Thou shalt not a yield become my liegeman. Thy kin have hewn far too many gaps in her house for it to be well that thou should settle here in this land. Go thou on to Iceland, and dwell there on thy father's inheritance. No harm will there touch you or your kin, but in this land it is to be looked for. Through all the days our kin will be more powerful. Yet for the sake of King Athelstan, my foster father, thou shalt have peace here in the land and shalt get law and land right, for I know that the old see you very dear. Aeil thanked the king for his words, and prayed that the king would give him sure tokens to Thord and Holland, or to other barons in Sorn and Hordeland. The king said that this should be done. Chapter 67 Aeil slays Lyot the Pale Thorstein and Eil made ready for their journey so soon as they had ended their errand. They then went their way back, and when they came south over the Dover fell, then said Eil that he would go down to Romsdale, and after that south by way of the sounds. I will, he said, finish my business in Sohn and Hordeland, for I would fain in the summer take my ship out to Iceland. Thorstein bade him settle his journeys as he would, so Thorstein and Eil separated. Thorstein went south by the dales all the way till he came to his estates. There he produced the tokens of the king and his message before the stewards that they should give up all the property which they had taken and Thorstein claimed. No one spoke against it, and he then took all of the property. Eil went his way, then began twelve in all. They came to Ramsdale, there got them conveyance, and then went south to Mary. Nothing is told of their journey before they came to the island called Hord, and went to pass the night at a farm named Bindheim. This was a well-to-do homestead, in which dwelt a baron named Fridgeir. He was young in years, and had but lately inherited his father's property. His mother was named Gida. She was a sister of Lord Aaron Bjorn, a woman of a noble presence and very wealthy. She managed the house for her son Fridgeir. They lived in grand style. There, Eil and his company found good welcome. In the evening, Eil sat next to Fridgeir and his comrades outside him. There was much drink and sumptuous viands. Gida, the house mistress, in the evening had some talk with Eil. She inquired about Aaron Bjorn, her brother, and other of her kinsmen and friends who had gone to England with Aaron Bjorn. Eil answered her questions. She asked what tidings had befallen in Eil's journey. He told her plainly. Then he sang, Gloomy on me glowered, in gruesome wrath a king. But cuckoo faints and fails not, for vulture flapping near, Aid good from our and beyond, as oft in peace I got, He falls not whom true friends help forward on his way. Eil was very cheerful that evening, but Fridgeir and his household were rather silent. Eil saw that 
there a maiden fair and well dressed. He was told that she was Fridgir's sister. The maiden was sad and wept constantly that evening, which they thought very strange. They were there for the night, but in the morning the wind was blowing hard and there was no putting out to sea. They need a boat to take them from the highland. Then went Fridgir and with him Gida to Eyjal, and offered that he and his comrades should stay there till it was good travelling weather, and should have then such help for the journey as they needed. This Eyjal accepted. They stayed there, weather bound for three nights, most hospitably entertained. After that, the weather became calm. Then Eil and his men rose up early in the morning and made ready, then went to meet and Eil was given them to drink, and they sat a while. Then they took their clothes. Eil stood up and thanked the master and mistress of the house for their entertainment. Then they went out. The master and his mother went out in the path with them. Gida then went to speak with her son Fridgir and talked low with him. Eil standing the while and waiting for them. Eil said to the maiden, Why weep you, young maiden? I never see you cheerful. She could not answer, but wept more. Fridgir now said to his mother aloud, I will not now ask this. They are even now ready for their journey. Then Gida went to Eil and said, I will tell you, Eil, how things stand here with us. There is a man named Lyot the Pale. He is a berserk and a duelist. He is hated. He came here and asked my daughter to wife, but we answered at once, refusing the match. Whereupon he challenged my son Fridgir to wager of battle, and he has to go tomorrow to combat on the island called Vors. Now I wished Eil that you should go to the combat with Fridgir. It would soon be shown if Har and Bjorn were here in the land, that we should not now endure the overbearing of such a fellow as Lot. Eil said, "'Tis but my bounden duty, lady, for the sake of Har and Bjorn, thy kinsman, that I go, if Fridgir thinks this any help to him." Herein you do well, said Gida, so we will go back into the hall and be all together for the whole day. Then Eil and the rest went into the hall and drank. They sat there for the day, but in the evening came those friends of Fridgir who had appointed to go with him, and there was a numerous company for the night and a great banquet. On the morrow Fridgir made ready to go and many with him, Eil being one of the party. It was now good travelling weather. They now start and soon come to the island. There was a fair plain near the sea which was to be the place of combat. The ground was marked out by stones lying round in a ring. Soon came Lyot and his party, then he made ready for combat. He had his shield and sword. Lot was a man of vast size and strength, and as he came forward on the field to the ground of combat, a fit of berserk fury seized him. He began to bellow hideously and bit his shield. Fridgir was not a tall man. He was slenderly built and not strong. He had not been used to combat, but when Eil saw Lot, he then sang a stave. It fits not young Fridgir to fight with this warrior, grim gnawer of shield rim by his gods who doth curse I better may meet him, may rescue this maiden, for fearsome he stareth, yet fey are his eyes. Lyot saw where Eil stood and heard his words. He said, Come thou thither, big man, to the holm and fight with me. If thou hast a wish that way, this is a far more even match than I should fight with Fridgir, for I shall deem me no whit the greater man though I lay low on earth. Then sang Eil, Lot asketh but little, loth were I to balk him, pale white my hand pliant, shall play on his mail, come busk me 
We for combat no quarter expect thou, strife stirrer and marry, stir shield cutting hours. After this, Ail made him ready for combat with Lot. Ail had the shield that he was wont to have, was girded with the sword which he called Adder, but in his hand he did have Drogenvaldi. He went in over the boundary that marked the battleground, but Lot was not ready. Ail shook his sword and sang, Hew we with hilt wands flashing, Hack we shield with falcon, Test me many moon targets, Tinge red sword in blood, Lot from life be sundered, Low stern play she Liam, Quelled the quarrel seeker, Come eagles to your prey, then Lot came forward on the field and declared the law of combat, that he should ever have to bear the name of Dastard who should draw back outside the boundary stones that were set up in a ring around the field of combat. This done, they closed and they dealt a blow at Lot, which Lot parried with his shield, but Ail then dealt blow upon blow so fast that Leo got no chance for a blow in return. He drew back to get room for a stroke, but Ail pressed as quickly after him, dealing blows with all his might. Lot went beyond the boundary stones far into the field. So ended the first bout. Then Lot begged for a rest. Ail let it be so. They stopped therefore and rested, and Ail sang, Free-handed gold-giver, back goeth your champion. In craven fear crouches this wealth-craving white. Not strongly fights spearsman, he strokes who delayeth low, beat by a bald head, this bragging pest flies. These were the laws of wager of battle in those times, that when one man challenged another on any claim, and the challenger gained the victory, then he should have his prize of victory, that which he had claimed in his challenge. But if he were vanquished, then should he ransom something for himself, for such prices should be fixed, but if he were slain on the field, then had he forfeited all possessions, and he who slew him in the combat should take his inheritance. This was also law, that if a foreigner died who had no heir in the land, then the inheritance fell to the king's treasury, and now Ail bade Lot to be ready. I will, he said, that we now try to be the uttermost this combat. Lot sprang swiftly to his feet. Ail bounded at him and dealt at once a blow. He pressed him so close that he was driven back and the shield shifted from before him. Then smote Ail at Lot, and the blow came on him above the knee, taking off his leg. Lot then fell and soon died. Then Ail went to where Fridgir and his party stood. He was heartily thanked for this work. Then sang Ail, Fallen lies the wolf feeder, foul worker of mischief, Lot's leg by scald severed, leaves Fridgir in peace. From the free gold giver, gird on now, none I seek me, sport I deem the deer speared in, sport with such pale foe. Lot's death was little mourned, for he had been a turbulent bully. He was a Swede by birth, and had no kin there in the land. He had come thither and amassed him wealth by duels. He had slain many worthy landowners, whom he had first challenged to wager a battle for their lands and heritage. He had now become very wealthy both in land and chattels. Eil went home with Fridgir from the field of combat. He stayed there but a short time before going south to Mari. Eil and Fridgir parted with much affection. Eil charged Fridgir with the securing of those lands that had belonged to Lot. Eil went on his way and came to the Firths, whence he went into Sown to seek Thord in Orland. Thord received him well. He declared his errand and the message of King Hakon. These words of Eil were taken well by Thord, promised him help in this matter. Eil remained there with Thord far into the spring. Chapter 68 of Eil's Journeyings Eil went on southwards to Hordland, 
taking for this journey a rowing vessel and there on thirty men. They came on a day to Asker on Faring Island. Eir went up to the house with twenty men, while ten guarded the ship. Atli the Short was there with some men. Eil bade him be called out and told that Eil Skatle Krimson had an errand with him. Atli took his weapons, as did all the fighting men that were there, and then they went out. Eil spoke, I am told, Atli, that you hold in keeping the property which of right belongs to me and my wife Asgurda. You will be like have heard it talked of ere now that I claim the inheritance of Bjorn Yeoman, which Bergnund, your brother, kept from me. I am now come to look after the property, lands and chattel, and to beg you give it up and pay it into my hands. Atli said, Long have we heard, Eil, that you are a most unjust man, but now I shall come to prove it. If you mean to claim at my hands this property which King Eric had judged to Bergen and my brother, King Eric had then power to bid and ban in this land. I was thinking now, Eil, that you would come here for this end to offer me a fine for my brothers whose lives you took, and that you would pay atonement for the pillage committed by you here at Asker. I would make answer to this proposal if you should plead this errand, but here to this offer I can make none. I shall then, said Eil, offer you, as I offered Ona, the Gula thing lost aside our cause. Your brothers I declare to have fallen without claim for fine and through their own wrong deeds, because they had first plundered me of law and land right and taken my property by force of arms. I have the king's leave herein to try the law with you in this cause. I summon you to the Gula thing, there to have lawful decision on this matter. To the Gula thing, said Adley, I will come, and we can hear there speak of this matter. Hereupon Eil with his comrades went away. He went north to Sown, then into Arland to Thord, his wife's kinsman and there he stayed till the Gula thing. And then when men came to the thing, then came Eil thither. Atli the Short was also there. They began to declare their cause, and pleaded it before those who were to judge. Eil made his demand of money due, but Atli offered against it as a lawful defense the oath of twelve men that he, Atli, had in keeping no money that belonged to Eil. And when Atli went before the court with his twelve who would swear, then went Eil to meet him, and said that he would not accept Atli's oaths for his own property. I will had offer you other law, and then we will do battle here at the thing, and he shall have the property, he who wins the victory. This was also law that Eil proposed an ancient custom that any man had a right to challenge another to wager of battle, whether he were defendant in a cause or prosecutor. Atli said that he would not refuse this to do battle with Eil, for, said he, you propose what I ought to have proposed, seeing that I have enough loss to avenge you. You have done to my death to my brothers, and far shall I be from upholding the right if I yield to you my own possessions, unlawfully rather than fight with you when you offer me this choice. So then Atli and Eil joined hands and pledged them to do battle, the victor to own the lands for which they had been fighting. After this they arrayed them for combat. Eil came forward with helm on head, and shield before him, and harbored in hand, but his sword, Dragon Vandil, he suspended from his right hand. It was the custom with those who fought in single combat so to arrange that the sword should need no drawing during the fight, but be attached to the arm to be ready at once when the combatant willed. Atli had the same arming as Eil. He was experienced in single combats, and was a strong man of good courage. 
to the field was led forth a bull, large and old, sacrificial beast such was termed, to be slain by him who won the victory. Sometimes there was one such ox, sometimes each combatant had his own led forth, and when they were ready for the combat, they then ran at each other, and first they drew the halberds, neither of which stood fast in the foreman's shield, but both struck in the ground. Then they took both to their swords, and went it with all blow upon blow, Atli gave no ground. They smote fast and hard and full, soon their shields were becoming useless, and when Atli's shield was of no use, then he cast it from him, and grasping his sword with both hands, dealt blows as quickly as possible. Egil fetched him a blow on the shoulder, but the sword bit not. He dealt another and a third. It was now easy to find parts in Atli that he could strike, since he had no cover and Eil brandished and brought down his sword with all his might, yet it bit not strike you where he might. Then Eil saw that nothing would be done this way, for his shield was now rendered useless, so Eil let drop both sword and shield, and bounding on Atli gripped him with his hands. Then the difference of strength was seen, and Atli fell right back, but Eil went down prone upon him, and bit through his throat. There Atli died. Eil leapt up at once and ran to where the victim stood. With one hand he gripped his lips, with the other his horn, and gave him such a wrench that he felt his feet slipped up his neck was broken, after which Eil went there with his comrades stood, and he sang, I bared blue Dragvandil, who bit not the buckler, Atli the short so blunted, all edge by his spells, straining my strength I grappled, staggered the wordy foeman, my tooth I bade bit him, best of swords in need. Then Nail got possession of all those lands for which he had contended and claimed, rightfully for him and his wife asked her. Nothing is told of further tidings of that thing. Ail then went first into Sown and arranged about those lands that he now got into his own power. He remained there for a great part of the spring. Afterwards he went with his comrades eastward to Vik, then to seek Thorstein, and was there for a while. Chapter 69 Eil comes out to Iceland. In the summer Eil prepared his ship, and when all was ready, at once set sail for Iceland. His voyage sped well. He came to Borgafirth and brought in his ship just below his own house. He had his cargo conveyed home and set up his ship. Eil stayed in his home that winter. He had now brought out very great wealth and was a very rich man. He had a large and lofty house. Eil was by no means meddlesome with other men's matters, nor generally presuming when here in Iceland nor did any try to encroach on what was his. Eil remained at home now for years, not a few. Eil and Asgard had children thus named, Bodvar, a son, and another son, Gunnar, Thorgerda, a daughter, and Bera. The youngest was Thorstein. All Eil's children were of good promise and intelligence. Thorgerda was the eldest of the children, Bera the next. Chapter 70 Eil Goes Abroad Eil heard tidings from east over the seas that Eric Bloodaxe had fallen in the west while freebooting, but Gunhilda and her sons and Eric had gone to Denmark, and all those that had followed Eric to England had left that country. This too he heard, that Arenbjorn was now come to Norway. He had taken again the grants and possessions that he had before, and had gotten great favour with the king. Then Eil thought it desirable again to go to Norway. Besides this came the tidings that King Athelstan was dead. His brother Edmund now ruled England. So Eil made ready his ship and got him a crew. Onansioni was among them, son of Oni of Anabreka. 
Anand was tall and the strongest of those men who were then in the countryside. Nay, some doubted whether he were not shape strong. Anand had often been on voyages from land to land. He was somewhat older than Eyal. There had long been friendship between the two. And when Eyal was ready, he put out to sea, and their voyage sped well. They came to mid-Norway, and when they sighted land, they steered for the firths. They soon got tidings from land, and it was told them that Aron Bjorn was at home on his estate. Eyal put his ship into the haven nearest Aron Bjorn's house, then went to seek Aron Bjorn. A most joyful meeting was theirs. Aron Bjorn offered quarters to Eyal, and such of his men as he liked to bring. This Eyal accepted, and he had his ship set up on rollers, but his crew found them quarters. Eyal and Eleven with him went to Aron Bjorn's. Eyal had caused to be made a long ship sail, elaborately worked. This he gave to Aron Bjorn, and yet other gifts of value. Eyal was there for the winter, treated with much honor. In the winter, Eyal went southwards to Sorn to collect his land rents, staying there some time. After that he came north again to the Firths. Aron Bjorn held a great Yule feast to which he bade his friends and the neighboring landowners. There was there much company and good cheer. Aron Bjorn gave Eyal as a Yule gift a trailing robe made of silk and richly broidered with gold, studded with gold buttons in front all down the hem. Aron Bjorn that had the robe made to fit Eyal's stature. Aron Bjorn gave also to Eyal at Yule a complete suit newly made. It was cut of English cloth of many colors. Friendly gifts of many kinds gave Aron Bjorn at Yule to those who were his guests, for Aron Bjorn was beyond all men open-handed and noble. Then Eyal composed a staff. Warrior gave to poet, silken robe gold glistering. Never shall I find me, friend of better faith. Aron Bjorn untiring, earneth well his honors, for his like the ages long may look in vain. Chapter 71 Eyal's Sadness Eyal after Yuletide was taken with much sadness that he spake not a word. And when Aron Bjorn perceived this, he began to talk with Eyal and asked what this sadness meant. I wish, said he, you would let me know whether you are sick or anything ails you that I may find a remedy. Eyal said, Sickness of body I have none, but I have much anxiety about this, how I shall get that property which I won when I slew Lot the Pale northwards in Myra. I am told that the king's stewards have taken up all that property and claimed ownership there for the king. Now I would fain have your help in the recovery of this. Aron Bjorn said, I do not think your claim to the ownership of the property is against the law of the land, yet methinks the property is now come into strong keeping. The king's treasury hath a wide entrance but a narrow exit. We have urged many arduous claims of money against powerful persons, but we were more in confidence with the king then than now, for the friendship between me and King Hakon is shallow. Yet must I act for the old saw, he must tend the oak who is to dwell beneath it. Yet, said Eyal, my mind is that if we have law to show, we should try. Maybe the king will grant us right in this, for I am told that the king is just and keeps well to the laws which he has made here in the land. I am rather minded to go seek the king and try this matter with him. Aron Bjorn said that he did not desire this. I think, Eyal, that these things will be hard to reconcile, your eagerness and daring in the king's temper and power, for I deem him to be no friend of yours, and for good reason as methinks, I would rather that we let this matter drop and not take it up, but if you wish it, Eyal, I will rather myself go to the king and point the question. Eyal said that he thanked him heartily and would choose that as the path. 
Hakon was then in Rogaland, but at times in Hordaland, there was no difficulty in finding him, and not long after this talk, Aaron Bjorn made ready for his journey. It was then publicly known that he proposed to seek the king. He manned with his house Karls a twenty-odd galley that he had. Eyal was to stay at home. Aaron Bjorn would not have him go. Aaron Bjorn started when ready, and his journey went well. He found King Hakon and was well received. And when he had been there a little while, he declared his errand before the king and said that Eyal Skatlakrimson was come here in the land and thought that he had a claim to all the property that had belonged to Lot the Pale. We are told, O king, that Eyal pleads but law in this, but your stewards have taken up the property and claimed ownership for you. I would pray you, my lord, that Eyal may get law herein. The king was slow to speak, but at length answered, I know not, Aaron Bjorn, why you come with such pleading for Eyal. He came once before me, and I told him that I would not have him sojourn here in the land for reasons which you already know. Now Eyal must not seek, seek such claims before me as he did before my brother Eric. And to thee, Aaron Bjorn, I have this to say. You may be here in the land only as long as you prefer, not foreigners before me and my word, for I know that thy heart is with Harold, son of Eric, thy foster son, and this is the best choice, to go to those brothers and be with them, for I strongly suspect that men like thee will not be the for me to trust if I and Eric's sons ever have to try conclusions. And when the king had spoken, Aaron Bjorn saw that it would not do to plead this cause any further with him, so he prepared to return home. The king was rather sullen and gloomy towards Aaron Bjorn after he knew his errand, but Aaron Bjorn was not in the mood to humble himself before the king over this matter. And so Aaron Bjorn parted. Aaron Bjorn went home and told Eyal the issue of his errand. I will not, said he, again plead such a cause to this king. Eyal at this report frowned much. He thought he had lost much wealth and wrongfully. A few days after, early one morning, when Aaron Bjorn was in his chamber and a few men were present, he had Eyal called forth. And when he came, then Aaron Bjorn had a chest opened and weighed out forty marks of silver, adding these words, This money I pay you, Eyal for those lands which belong to Lot the Pale. I deem it just that you should have this reward from me and my kinsman Fridgir for saving his life from Lot, for I know that you did this for love of me. I therefore am bound not to let you be cheated of your lawful right in this matter. Eyal took the money and thanked Aaron Bjorn. Then Eyal again became quite cheerful. Chapter 72 of Aaron Bjorn's Herring. Aaron Bjorn stayed at home on his estate that winter, but in the next spring he let it be known that he meant to go out plundering. Aaron Bjorn had good choice of ships. He made ready in the spring three warships, all large, and he had three hundred men. His house calls he had on his own ship, which was excellent equipped. He had also with him many landowners' sons. Eyal settled to go with him. He steered the ship, and with him went many of the comrades whom he brought from Iceland. But the merchant ship which he brought from Iceland, he caused to be moved eastwards to Vik, getting some men there to dispose of the cargo. But Aaron Bjorn and Eyal with the warships held a southward course along the coast then took their force still southwards to Saxland, where they harried in the summer and got much wealth. As autumn came on they, they came back hard by. The fields were soaked because there had been much rain. They resolved to go up there and left behind a third of their force to guard the ships. They followed up the river, keeping between it and the woods. Soon they came to a hamlet where dwelt several peasants. People ran out of the hamlet into the fields, such as could do so, when they perceived the enemy, but the freebooters pursued them. 
Then they came to a second village and a third. All the people fled before them. The land was level, flat fields everywhere, intersected by dikes full of water. But these the corn lands, or meadows were enclosed, and some places large stakes were set, and over the dike where men should go were bridges and planks laid. The country folk fled to the forest. But when the freebooters had gone far into the settled parts, the Frisians gathered them in the woods. And when they had assembled three hundred men, they went against the freebooters, resolved to give them battle. There was then some hard fighting, but the end was that the Frisians fled, and the freebooters pursued the fugitives. The peasants that escaped were scattered far and wide. Eyal was hotly pursuing, and a few with him, after a numerous company that fled. The Frisians came to a dike over which they went, and then drew away the bridge. Then came up Eyal and his men over the bank. Eyal at once went at the dike and leapt, but it was no leap for other men, and no one tried. But when the Frisians saw that but one man was following, they turned back and attacked him. But he defended himself well, and used the dike to cover him behind so that they could not attack him on all sides. Eleven men sat on him, but the end of their encounter was that he slew all eleven. After that, Eyal pushed out the bridge over the dike and crossed it back again. He then saw that all his people had turned back to the ships. He was then near the wood, and he now went along the wood towards the ships so that he had the choice of the wood if he needed shelter. The freebooters had brought down to the shore much booty and cattle, and when they came to the ships, some slaughtered the cattle, some carried out the plunder to the ships, some stood higher up and formed a shieldberg, for the freebooters had brought down to them much booty and cattle, and when they came to the ships, they were all slaughtered about cattle, blood in the water, when Aegir came down and saw how matters stood, he ran at full speed right at the throne. His halberd he held before him, grasped in both hands and slung his shield behind his back. He thrust forward his halberd, and all before him started aside, and so he got passage right through their ranks. Thus he dashed down to his men who looked at him as recovered from the dead. Then they went on shipboard and loosed from land. They sailed then to Denmark, and when they came to Lima Firth and lay at halls, Arnbjorn held a meeting of his men and laid before them his plans. Now will I, said he, go seek Eric's son with such force as will follow me. I have now learnt that the brothers are in Denmark here and maintain a large following and spend the summers in harrying, but for the winters abide here in Denmark. I now give leave to all to go to Norway, who would rather do that than follow me. For you, Eyal, methinks the best counsel is that, as soon as we part, you return to Norway, and then on with all speed to Iceland. Then the men separated to their several ships. Those who wished to go back to Norway joined Eyal, but by far the larger part of the force followed Arn Bjorn. Arn Bjorn and Eil parted in love and friendship. Arn Bjorn went to seek Eric's sons and joined the company of Harald Greyfair. His foster son was with him henceforth, as that both they long lived. Eil went northwards to Vik and on to Osla Firth. There was his merchant ship, which he had caused to be moved in the spring. There were also his cargo and the men he had gone with him to his ship. Thorstein Thora's son came to seek Eil and asked him such men as he would bring to stay with him that winter. Eil accepted the offer, had had his ship set up for cargo safely bestowed. Of his followers, some got quarters there. Some went to their several homes in the north. Eil and a company of ten or twelve went to Thorstein's and remained there for the winter as an honored guest.